Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ken, uh, Ken Davidian, who is, uh, he's worked for the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation in Washington, D.C. since 2008, and is currently the AST Director of Research and Program Manager for the FAA Center of Excellence for Commercial Space Transportation. Uh, Dr. Davidian currently also serves as Editor-in-Chief of the journal New Space, Adjunct Instructor at Virginia Tech Pamplin College of Business, Chair of the IAF Entrepreneurial and Investment Committee, Vice Chair of the IAF Space Economy Committee, and a member of the Ohio State University Aerospace Engineering's External Advisory Board. So Ken is a very busy person, uh, so I'm glad to turn it over to Ken. Ken, if you would, go ahead and take control of it there. Thank you very much. Uh, while I wait for the ability to share my screen, I, I'll just say that I would like to thank the organizing committee of this symposium, including Brian and Steve Garber of NASA, um, Rick Sertivan of the U.S. Air Force and Stephen Waring of University of Alabama Huntsville for giving me the opportunity to participate in the planning and the execution of this meeting. There we go. I think I'm sharing my screen now. Good, good, good. Um, they've all been patient with my ideas and my methods, so I thank them very much. That out of the way. Okay. Um, I also thank them for the opportunity to give this keynote on the definition of the word commercial. I approached this talk in a, with a very specific intention to make this the beginning of a conversation. And I imagine a methodology based on a story entitled The American Claimant by Mark Twain. In that story, Twain describes an event called the Mechanics Club Debate, a way of discussing a topic that I always thought was interesting. In front of a gathered audience, an essayist reads a prepared text on a topic for public debate. The subject is not immediately discussed, but audience members who wish to offer counterpoints, rebuttals, or additional observations can put their thoughts in writing and present them by reading their essays at a subsequent meeting. This method gives people time to think about what they've heard, gives them the opportunity to formulate their words, and results in a concise presentation that reflects clarity of logic and depth of discussion. I imagine myself as this meeting's essayist, reading my prepared text of ideas on the definition of the word commercial. I'll talk about this with respect to space activities to you, an interested audience of space community members. It's my hope that some of you will hear my ideas and feel sufficiently compelled to compose counterpoints, rebuttals, or additional observations on the topic for presentation at a future opportunity. As editor-in-chief of a journal called New Space, I invite you to send your written thoughts to me, and I can include them in future issues of the journal as appropriate. Normally, I would start this discussion with an explanation of why we need a definition for the term commercial, but I want to hold that part of the discussion until the end of the, the talk. Instead, I'll start with a quick history of commercial activities before talking about the cognitive constructs surrounding the word, the different ways the word has been defined in the past, and then some early theorizing about the definition before actually talking about why we need to define it in the first place. So let's get started. Historically, different societal, social groups have defined the word commercial in different ways. And the social status of people engaged in commercial activities varies over time, too. For example, historians have described the perception of commercial enterprise during the early Greco-Roman times as demeaning, corrupting, and money-grubbing. In medieval Europe, historians explained that one of the oldest stereotypes in European history is the leisured aristocrat who abhors commerce as derogatory and beneath his social status. Being in trade was considered ignoble, and in some European countries before the 18th century, notably France, titled aristocrats were legally barred from any business but farming, government service, and warfare. It may be these perceptions still exist today to some extent in the remnants of the Roman Empire. Under the Islamic Empire, however, commercial activities were encouraged by institutions in the fields of science and technology, but never received formal approval from other institutions such as religion. The point of these examples is, to, is that regardless of what we think the definite commercial is, it may only be relevant to our particular social group in this particular time period. Although the, defining the word commercial has long been recognized as being hard, a hard thing to do, the real trick is to come up with a definition that transcends different social groups and times. Next, any discussion about the definition of the word commercial can be problematic. So before defining the word, it's beneficial to define how we define the word. As is the case of historians using the word 
civilization, there is the implication of a bifurcation. Some societal groups were characterized as civilized, and by doing that, there was an implication that other groups were not civilized. Similarly, by calling some activities commercial, there's an implication that some activities are not commercial, and the impact of this delineation can be significant or not. In any case, these are all cognitive or intellectual constructs, meaning they're not an intrinsic property of the group or activity under investigation. They're properties we invent to describe them. So, for the word civilization, historians abandoned using the word as an absolute label and adopted an approach that is similar to that used by the medical community when diagnosing an illness. In the historical context, social groupings possess different characteristics of civilizations to some degree. A societal group can possess some level of these characteristics, and each characteristic is like a dial that can be turned to some value from zero to 100%. The overall characteristic of civilization is ambiguous and vague, primarily because each dimension is a nonlinear combination of multiple sub-factors, and they all have nonlinear codependencies, as in any complicated system of systems. The ultimate conclusion of this discussion about civilization as applied to the concept of commercial is that space activities are neither commercial or non-commercial, but they are all commercial to some degree given they possess some level of the many defining characteristics. So what are those characteristics? This is where we need to start defining the word itself. And to do that, we'll now look at how this was attempted in three different professional arenas. First, the legal profession has grappled with the question of how to define the word commercial for a long time. Despite attempts starting in the 1970s, multiple courts have not been able to define what constitutes commercial speech. The two primary reasons for needing a definition of the word was first, to describe or to determine when the immunity afforded to foreign states could be withheld in cases when they engaged in commercial activity on US soil, and second, to identify the boundaries of First Amendment protections. Efforts by the courts to define discrete boundaries ar around commercial speech have been described as fumbling. Eventually, there was a realization that the concept of commercial requires a more nuanced approach based on smaller discrete categories. This is consistent with the historical preference for a listing of characteristics rather than a single discrete definition. Second, Many individuals in the space industry, including myself, have written papers attempting to list the characteristics that define the concept of commercial. The sources used to identify these characteristics include governmental documents, policies, reports, and sometimes the author's personal observations and experiences. The list of characteristics includes a broad and untamed collection of concepts and phrases. Many of these concepts are consistent with the 2010 U.S. National Space Policy. An interesting assertion of this definition is that an activity can be considered commercial even if the only customer is the government, as long as a potential for a non-governmental customer exists. This portion of the definition seems rather forgiving, especially if there's no clear way to determine how real the existence is of a potential non-governmental customer. Our last attempt to define the word commercial is in the field of management. Some management scholars have identified commercial activities as characterized by the private appropriation of the surplus and private investment decisions. Private investment decisions implies the existence of a capitalist system, and this leads us down an entirely different rabbit hole. Like civilization and commercial, capitalism is a cognitive construct and similarly cannot be defined in a bifurcated fashion. Economic systems are neither capitalist or non-capitalist. Economic systems possess a degree of capitalism determined by the specific amount of capitalistic characteristics that exist. I'm not sure the two terms are perfectly synonymous, but it seems that commercial and capitalism are linked in some way, based on the characteristic of private ownership of capital. Unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about this topic today, but I'd be happy to engage in this discussion at a later time. Up to this point, I've been talking about attempts to define the word commercial from different perspectives in the past. And now it's time to introduce my recent thoughts on the topic. I tend to think of, about commercial space activities at the level of markets. Levels of analysis are ways that management scientists think about different, so, different social structures within organizations at the intra-organizational levels. 
at the organizational level and at the inter-organizational levels, including multiple organizations, and sometimes called market levels. Each level is part of a nested and embedded hierarchy. The lowest market level is made up of similar firms, many civil, similar firms, grouped into what might be called an industry segment. An example of an industry segment could be firms producing liquid rocket engines. Multiple industry segments are nested together within a level called an industry. Continuing our example, the liquid rocket engine and solid rocket motor industry segments are combined into the propulsion industry. Finally, multiple industries are nested together within the level called a field, a market, or an ecosystem. It is at these three market levels, industry segments, industries, and fields, that I work to define the word commercial. One-way organization theory frames the discussion of, in of innovation is, to s is a set of models describing how organizations change. Organizational change at market levels of analysis, after all, is a major part of the innovation process that characterizes new, emerging, and evolving markets. Organization theory identifies four ideal organization change motors describing how innovation is induced. These motors are categorized in a two-by-two two matrix based on different units of analysis, referring to one organization or multiple organizations, and modes of change, whether the motor follows a prescribed series of steps or the change is externally constructed or directed. The four organizational change models are teleology, life cycle, dialectic, and evolution. Two of these models, life cycle and dialectic, do not describe the past or present state of space activities very well. The life cycle model of organizational change is characteristic of highly regulated environments or standardized and controlled markets where organizations proceed through well-defined stages in a prescribed sequence. Developing and bringing up bringing a new pharmaceutical or medical device to market is an example of a life cycle organizational change because drug, com drug companies follow specific steps to gain technical, regulatory, and market approvals of a new drug. The dialectic model of organizational change is a process mechanism between two organizations, deliberately constructing a novel result, a synthesis from an established status quo organization, which represents the thesis, and a conflicting or confronting organization representing the antithesis. The resulting organization is not one or the other of the two original organizations, but it's something new and different. Neither of these two models, life cycle or dialectic, describe commercial space activities very well. The third model of, of organizational change, the teleologic model, describes the process of deliberate and purposeful innovation is directed or constructed by a single entity, such as a central committee or an agency. Organizational members in the teleologic model do not set their own goals, but follow directions from the single guiding authority who decides between competing ideas. This model is a good fit for space activities during the space race era of the 1960s, and it's also applicable to many governmental space activities of today. It is not, however, a good description for what we think of as commercial space activities. The final model the evolution motor of organization change involves multiple organizations following a prescribed set of forces, variation, selection, and retention. All three forces are always present, and the strength of any one force may be dominant over the other two at different times of industry emergence, and organizations progress through them in a serial fashion. For many reasons, for many reasons, I think this model best represents what we commonly call commercial markets. One reason is that defining characteristic of the evolution motor is the presence of competition between organizations. Market level organizations, including industry segments, industries and sectors that are subject to the evolution model, motor have three have distinct characteristics. First, they do not necessarily deliver products with the highest technical uh, performance. Commercial markets have famously retained dominant designs that are technically inferior to other options being offered. Historic examples include the VHS videotape format that beat out Sony Betamax or the QWERTY keyboard over the more efficient Dvorak keyboard. Second, commercial markets characteristically do not necessarily provide maximum benefit to society at first. A common complaint against new products is their exclusive avail availability only to very affluent customers, as was the case in the automobile, for example. We also hear the same complaint with regards to suborbital and orbital space tourism. 
Although the spillover of a technology's benefits to all of society may eventually be realized, it typically does not happen at the outset of industry emergence. Third, markets are typically slow to emerge since evolution forces do not deliver the quickest results. Centuries can pass before an, an innovation evolves into a usable form, as was the case with the steam engine. Fourth, by encouraging multiple sources of innovation within the same niche, emerging markets encourage duplicative use of resources, which can be considered inefficient. The US government recognized these characteristics during the space race of the 1960s and decided to accelerate the innovation process by implementing a different set of forces best described by the teleologic change motor. One last interesting item that scholars point out is that due to these inherent inefficiencies in new and emerging commercial markets, few people know exactly what they are doing or why. This exact point was made by Clayton Christensen when he showed how industry experts could accurately predict the performance of established industries, but these same experts were wildly wrong in their predictions of new and emerging markets. Of course, entrepreneurs and investors will rarely admit this in public, but we see it when companies start by pitching one business plan at first, only to pivot when potential customers require something different than what the company originally proposed. We also witness this when space companies offer products without knowing the price points that potential customers will accept. This is normal in the world of new emerging and evolving markets. This also means it is difficult to predict how these innovative mar commercial markets will perform. We need to remember this when managers ask questions about these new markets. The bottom line up front is that nobody really knows the answer to these questions. There may be intelligent ways to respond to these questions, but any result should clearly state the sources and qualitative levels of uncertainty at the very least. Because the evolution model of organizational change seemingly best fits what I would consider commercial markets, I'd like to provide more detail about the three evolution model forces. What I find interesting about this line of thinking is that the first, this is the first step toward theory creation. These ideas can support the introduction of propositions that through operationalization, hypothesizing, data collection, and validation could lead to a robust means of qu at least qualifying the different characteristics of markets we refer to as commercial. The first proposition would be that the presence and strength of the three evolution model forces are positively related to the degree which market organizations can be considered commercial. Basically, the stronger the individual forces of variation selection retention are, the more commercial a market organization is. Again, I'm referring to an industry segment, an industry, or an ecosystem. The next step in this discussion is to assert propositions for each of the three evolution forces. These propositions can begin to identify potential independent variables for each force and the relationships to each other and to the force itself. However, at this point, I'm going to stop the discussion of propositions, independent variables, and theory building because it starts getting complicated. I have a recent paper in Acta Astronautica that goes into more detail about the two organizational change motors and how they fit the activities of the space race era and current suborbital space tourism. If you want to read about that, but it also begins the, the discussion of operationalizing the propositions for each of the evolution model forces. Interestingly, a recent report about the Chinese commercial space industry by the Science and Technology Policy Institute, a definition of commercial was given that identifies three specific instances of the evolution model forces without ever explicitly referring to them. For example, the reference to independence from a government agency or membership is an inference of the variation force. The reference to private parties taking risk describes a part of the selection force. And the reference to customers other than the government clearly is a part of the retention force. Again, these instances are not fully descriptive of any of the three, of all of the three forces, but they clearly are representative of the evolution model of organization change. To close things out, we can now return to the question of why it is important to have a definition of the word commercial in the first place. There seems to be an increasing level of interest around the world among members of space organizations and companies about commercial space. The number of papers presented at the International Astronautical Congress on commercial space topics shows a general increasing trend, and the overall number of Google Scholar citations also shows an increase in recent years. Interest can be driven by many factors. For example, government and company managers need a better understanding of the outside world, 
to anticipate the appropriate actions and reactions they could take in response to external events that might affect them. Government agencies want to know what is happening and what might happen with the goal of making internal changes to be more efficient and effective in their interactions with commercial actors. Private companies need to know what's going on in order to strategize different actions and reactions to maximize their benefits and minimize their risks. As commercial activities increase, their impact on the space industry also increases, so improved, improved strategic planning requires better awareness. To become more aware, organizations turn to service providers, such as consulting individuals or companies or other nonprofit organizations, to answer obvious questions such as what is happening, who are the actors, what are they doing, who's funding them, when will their activities impact my organization, and in what way. These service providers offer data about commercial space activities despite the lack of a clear understanding of what commercial space activities exactly are. The definitions tend to be implicit, so what the service provider and customer define as commercial could be different things. How can managers be expected to make insightful decisions to shape future policy or strategy when information they rely on is not well defined? Therefore, better awareness requires a better definition. This is one reason why it is important to get a better understanding of what is meant by commercial space, not simply to communicate better, but communicate better information about the external environment to industry leaders. As a last example of why definition is so important, I want to refer to a report that was released one month ago today by the Secure World and Kalis Foundations, entitled Lost Without Translation. As the title goes on to explain, the report identifies gaps in US perceptions of the Chinese commercial space sector. One of the main reasons for these gaps is the lack of an understanding of what commercial means, and people interviewed for the report admitted not knowing whether a commercial space sector actually exists in China. How can U.S. companies make an accurate strategic assessment when they can't even interpret what is in plain sight? The report goes on that perhaps the most basic yet substantial gap in understanding was over whether there actually is a commercial space sector in China. Part of this is due, in fact, is due to the fact that the term commercial space is without a clear definition and means different things to different people. So, in conclusion, trying to define commercial space may be difficult because the definition means different things to different societies. It changes over time, requires a nuanced approach, and it's not simple. I think important results can come from the approach I've just described, but it's important to realize this is just one possible perspective. I hope to hear your feedback and ideas on this subject. And with that, I'll conclude my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.